Robert, good for you to come back again. It's nice to see you again. It's been a little over a year. We, well, yeah, I think I had a beard the last time. You look much nicer. Yeah, well, like, <laughs> younger is the hope. <laughs> ah, yes. Well, leave that subject for another time. Exactly. <laughs> Passing of youth. Uh, before we get to uh, what you're doing in the markets today, give your view on the whole thing cropping up again in index funds and how, you know, why, why, why should one try to strive as you do to do well? You've done it, but uh, uh, well, you know, fees and what, 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 what's the well, case for I, I what, tell you're, people, what you do? I, you know, I, I, and I, I, I tell people that, it, it, that if, um, you know, many clients, high, the high net worth businesses are basic business, we're in the mutual fund business, but our basic business is the, and I, when that question comes up at a meeting, I, I say, look, if you, can, if you can buy an index fund and stick with it and not let your emotions get in the way, then do it. But there are very few people who can actually do it. There's a reason why most people dramatically underperform the market is that they let their emotions get in the way and they tend to <coughs> get out at the wrong times and they tend to pile back in after the market has, has gone back up. So one of the reasons you pay a professional money manager is to provide a distance between your money and your emotions. And what your, the professional money manager is supposed to do is not to be so emotional and to be more analytical and to keep you invested because what we've all learned over the last many, many years is that staying invested is the way you make money in, 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 the, in the stock market. Now, it is also true, and you know, I toot my own horn a little bit because we've been able to do a little better than the market over the years. But if you you only have to do a little better than the market over the years to make a profound difference in you know, because of the miracle of compound. You know, they when Albert Einstein was asked what was mankind's greatest invention, he said compound interest. And the the, the truth is that if you're if you if you can do 50, 60, 70 basis points, about 100 basis points better than the market over a 20 year period. That doesn't mean every year you do it, but over that period of time, you, it can make a profound difference in, in, in how much more, uh, money you've been, and wealth you've been able to accumulate. So I think those are the two reasons. The first reason simply is the separation between you and your money and the emotions that are involved when you're, this feeling that you're getting in this pit of your stomach when the markets are going down. It's easier for a money manager to handle that, I think, a professional money manager than it is for most people. And the second reason is if you have a manager that can do a little bit better than the market over time, it'll make profound differences. But, it, you, but you have to be talking about long periods of time. You can't be talking about one, two, three, four, five years. It's a, you know, a, a investing's a marathon. It's a 20 year kind of thing. And if you can look at it for very long periods of time, professional management can make a difference. That's what I tell them. Sometimes it works. So it's like a physical coach, you know the exercises, but somebody's got to make you do it. Well, that's true, too. <coughs> that's true, too. Uh, yeah, there you, um, uh, you know, you don't show up and you disappoint the, the, uh, your personal trainer, and so you show up in order so that he's not disappointed, right? Yeah. Uh, but again, it's the discipline. It is discipline, exactly. And, uh, and, and distance, sort of, a, sort of a, an impartiality uh, it, that a lot of people just can't, you know, they can't stand it when they see the money that they work so hard going down in bear markets, and we're going to have bear markets. We may have, a, we may have one this year. <laughs> so they're going to happen, and you've got to be, you've got to have some distance from that. Otherwise, it's very hard to be a successful investor. Don't hold me to the numbers, but uh, somebody uh, did the numbers. If you take the S&P, which began in 1926, I think, and uh, you'd invested uh, 1,000 and reinvested, not taxes and all that kind right. of thing. Uh, the S and P did reinvesting, and uh, if what um, individuals have done, which is about three percentage points less than right. uh, the average, it makes almost an eightfold difference. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in the performance. I'm surprised it's not even more. Uh, uh, yeah, it, so it, it, it's astonishing. Most of that difference is due to the timing of moving money in and moving out money yeah. out of the markets. It, it, it hasn't necessarily been that the public has been s bad stock selectors. It's been that they've got enthusiastic at the wrong time and unenthusiastic at the wrong time. Uh, quickly define again for us contrarian anti-consensus. Your little take on uh, well, all right. So, so, uh, so I'm you know I'm a value guy, uh, but um, but the starting point for most of our ideas generation is. 
we want to be on the sort of the opposite side of, a, of, a, of whatever the consensus is. Uh, the consensus is in the price. That's right. The consensus, by definition, you know, if consensus means anything in the stock market, it means that it, that's reflected in the price, right? So we want to. So our feeling is it's very hard to make money when you agree with everybody else. Uh, you might not lose a lot of money, but it's very hard to make money. So we want our starting point is taking a look at, at things that are, are are out of favor or where the consensus is that things are bad. Now the consensus is very often right, just because you know my my, my partner likes to say just because everybody says it's raining, that's no reason to leave your umbrella at home. So <laughs> so the consensus is very often right, but but if you can do your work and come up with some gems that you sometimes find in these situations. And very often it, it has to do with not so much that you're smarter than anybody else, but that you have a different time frame than what is causing the price to be low. So take, for example, Target. I mean, just a, a, an example, not that we own Target because we don't, but Target just got hit with this you know, whole issue of, of yep. the uh, uh, credit cards <coughs> and everything, and, and the stock gets blasted as a result of that, and, and, and the consensus is that they're in real trouble. Well, you know, maybe they are, but, that, but are they going to be in real trouble three years from now or four years from now? And, and what's more important to the ultimate uh, valuation of that company, the, what's going on right today or what their long-term earnings uh, projections are supposed to be? So I think that's, that's the way we try to look at things. We try to take advantage of these hiccups that occur with individual names and see if we can make a value case for them over a longer-term period of time. Tell us again, small companies versus big companies. Uh, Big companies, it's obvious, small right. companies. It requires a little more work. Uh, I think that, so what I like to say is that you don't, have to, you, don't, you don't have to really search for big companies that are out of favor. They're, you know, it's in your face. It's, on the, it's in the news media, it's on television, it's in the papers and everything. All the analysts are talking about it. So that's pretty obvious. So a company like a Target or a company like a Coke, which sort of fell out of bed this week because of bad earnings, you don't have to dig very hard to do it. Smaller companies are, are not as widely followed. It requires more work and it requires more, more digging. And sometimes it's not so much that they are, that something bad has happened to them, but it's more the case that they've just been, there's an ennui associated with them. There's just nobody cares. And they've been neglected for so long that, it, there's, that, that there's no consensus that is reflected in, in their price. It's just, and so those are harder to find. And very often, however, if you can find them, they can be much more rewarding. But uh, but it does require more digging. In a period like the one we've just gone through, the, beginning in 2009, and I was just telling uh, my colleague that the, you know, the market is up 180% from the end of February of two, in 2009 to now. So in, er, in early in that period, you didn't really have to look for small companies. I mean, there were so many big companies that were attractively priced, that it, it didn't make sense to do the kind of digging that you would, you'd need to do to find the more esoteric names. Nowadays, I think it, it, the opposite is true. I think the big company, most of the big company names that we looked at and bought are now fairly valued or fully valued. And the, it's, it, you have to dig deeper into the, into the capitalization structure to find attractive names that haven't been exploited. On uh, performance, you mentioned over 10 years or You've done better and compounding works. Yeah. <coughs> You've had some hiccups. Yep. Uh, in recent times, one month you're up, another month you're down. Uh, you said uh, sometimes underperforming is a badge, and you had a, the wit to say a red badge <laughs> of courage. Uh, well, certainly, f certainly. I.e., uh, you're disciplined. <laughs> yes, I think that the if, if you underperform because you're not chasing things that are working but you don't understand, that is a red badge of courage because you can get in real trouble in this business just following what seems to be working without knowing what the investment case is or what the investment reason for it is. I mean, the classic example were the, you know, the uh, technology names at the end of the 1990s. But there's, there, there, there are a number of situations where a certain group of stocks are in vogue and you feel like you can't be left out of that and you buy them and so you're the last one to know um, so, so I think it's important to be unafraid of underperforming if you're underperforming for the right reasons. And, you know, that's, it's, that's easier to say than it is to live through because when you're living through it, it's really, it's sort of painful, but you have to do it at times. In our case, uh, I think that it was the late 90s where we were, where the underperformance was the most 
noticeable, but we had a tremendous record for the next 10 years after that, and it was all due to the fact that we stuck to our disciplines at a time when, when a lot of our peers were not. So. Now, uh, talking about emotion before we get to stocks, do you uh, find that individuals are still leery of the market, or now they're coming in now that it's uh, going up uh, I, so I much? I think that uh, on balance, they're still leery of the market. Uh, it, reinforced I, by what happened in January. Well, I think reinforced. <laughs> well, I think reinforced. Primary. I think there's a lot of things going on here. But the 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 my, my my real thesis on this is that there's been kind of a structural, generational, secular kind of change in v about what who who should be invested in the market in the first place. I'm old enough. My my parents' generation were it was a generation where they all said you know, the stock market isn't the right place for the little guy. I mean, that was sort of a mantra. Everybody believed that was true for, you know, for decades after the Depression. And then somehow in between now and the 1980s, it became just the opposite. It was, you were a fool if you weren't in the stock market. And so I think we're going through another change now where a lot of people think that, you know, the, they've been burned twice badly. They were burned at the end of the 90s. They were burned uh, in the 2008 period. And, and significantly burned. And I think that there was a, there's a sea change about what is an appropriate investment for the average Joe. Um, and that may be healthy, uh, but in this market rally that we've had, the return to the equity market that you would have seen at any other time in the last 30 or 40 years or so hasn't really happened. The big money flows for most of this time period was not in the equity market at all. It was in the bond market where there were no returns. But people felt that that was safe and not volatile. Now it may turn out that that's not true, but that was what the feeling was. And so the, the, I, I think that there's, <coughs> there has been a sea change in, with respect to a, a generational idea. I also think that, it, that, that is what's affecting this is that the baby boomers are retiring. I think, what is it, 10,000 a day? And a, and a retired person, by and large, is not a saving person. A retired person is somebody who's living off their savings. And so I think you're seeing flows out of the markets by people who need to live off their, off of their savings. And they're in a zero interest rate environment, they can't really get income from their savings, so they have to spend their capital. So I think you've got that working against the stock market as well. Now, those both can be overwhelmed uh, by, uh, by wild enthusiasm if the market continues to do very, very well. And maybe they'll, you know, the, the dam will finally burst. But we haven't seen it, and, I, and, I, and the numbers don't show it. So I think that's where we are. Makes it a little tougher to be a money manager these days. Yeah. Uh, taking first the macro approach, uh, how, how, how do you look at things now? Uh, Europe doesn't look like it's uh, going to uh, end yet. Right. Uh, people are actually buying s Spanish and Italian bonds. Right. Ukrainian bonds until just recently, I guess. Uh, you know, it's, it's been so long since we've had a normal winter that I think Analysts and, and economists have forgotten what winter does to economic numbers and what winter does to the e economic activity. And so I suspect that the underlying economic activity in this country is better than what the numbers have been showing. And I think that part of the reason for that is that people just don't remember what winters did because we haven't had a winter like this one in a, in a good many years. Um, so I think the U.S. is it's nowhere near the, its trend line of what growth should be, and I'm not sure we'll ever get back to those trend lines because I think the policies coming out of Washington and the regulations are so onerous that we may be on a new growth path. We may be a 2.5% grower instead of a 3.5%, 4% grower. But I do think that, the, that we are still in a, grow, a, a tepid growth mode, and that's basically good for the economy and basically good for equities. Um, Europe is, I think you could say the same thing, but dial it down a notch or so. It's, it's not recovered the way you would like to see it recover, but Europe is a half a step behind us or a full step behind us most of the time anyway. It's certainly better than it was in Europe two years ago, right? And, and China, to me China is the big uh, uh, question mark because China, uh, China's growth has been so robust and nothing grows to the sky and there has to be massive overbuilding in something over there, and I just don't know what it is. And sooner or later, I think they'll have a nasty recession. It would be unprecedented if they didn't. I mean, how could they not have a recession one of these days? So that, it, that could be <coughs> the fly in the ointment, and I don't know when that 
actually happens, and, but that is something to keep an eye on. So, now, markets tend not really to collapse. I mean, they, they have their corrections and all with, with respect to economic activities, but they tend to collapse when there's unexpected developments that you, unforeseen developments that occur. And, and so, for example, when the, the federal government nationalized Fannie and Freddie, nobody expected that. And that started the whole, uh, you know, uh, cacophony and, uh, of, of problems in, in the summer of, uh, or in the, in the fall of 2008. So you never know what could come out of, uh, what could occur that would really cause things to, 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 to collapse. Maybe the Russian-Ukrainian situation could be such a uh, thing. Maybe the Chinese and the Japanese squaring off over some islands that nobody cares about. And, you know, so there are things like that that are out there and th that are unpredictable. And if that happens, you know, all bets are off the table. You could have another big decline in the market. But, but just based on pure economic factors, I think the underlying trends are they're tepid but positive, which isn't great, but it's better than tepid but negative. So start with gold. It's come down from uh, 2011. Yep, a lot. Uh, why and uh, where does it go from here? Well, <laughs> so firstly, the, the um, gold, uh, in, in gold market, just like all markets, is a discounting mechanism. And so, uh, and what I said in a piece that we sent to you earlier today is that whatever, whatever the markets are supposed to discount, it's not the present and it's not the past. They're, they're supposed to discount the future. Right. Now, their future that they discount <coughs> may be inaccurate, in which case there'll, there'll be an adjustment process and they'll rediscount it. So, um, uh, but, but, but they're, discount, they're looking into the future and they're, and, and, and they're trying to gauge you know, what, what's gonna happen. So, so gold, I think, when it got to 1900, was, it was at a time when Europe was still unwinding, the euro was still unwinding, our own situation over here was uh, uh, ballooning out of control. Government deficits were ballooning out of control. And I think that the discounting mechanism was seeing sort of no end in sight to those issues. So you could argue that, that, that the reason that gold went from 1900 down to 1200 was that it appeared to many participants in the market that things were, not that they were getting better, but they weren't as bad as they thought they were. And, I, and, and so I think that that's a, that's a reasonable uh, rationale for why a market that had gone up by as much as gold had could decline by as much as a third. That said, none of these problems have really been addressed. The, the underlying sort of bankruptcy of the, of the entitlement states in Europe and the United States have not, they, they're not unknown. And so that may uh, impact the way people look at the price of gold, but they certainly haven't been addressed and they certainly haven't been solved. And so that process is still in front of us. And so I think gold will go up and down based on people's uh, uh, suspicion of how well the politicians are addressing the underlying problems which make the value of the currencies of the countries either valuable or not. And, and gold is just the inverse, really, of fiat money. And so that's, it goes up and down on the basis of sort of confidence of, of our government getting their arms around the problems. And right now, I think the feeling is that governments are in better shape than they were two years ago, three years ago when, when gold hit its high. But gold has been bouncing back pretty sharply in the last two or three months or so. So I don't think that the, the verdict is in yet that they've solved the welfare state issues. I think that that is a problem that has to be solved over the course of the next five, 10 years. Talking about stocks, you mentioned the big names. Right. Maybe you get a Coca-Cola once in a while, but uh, They've had much of a run. Uh, what, are, what are some of your favorites now? I see you have bought Bob Evans Farms. I have bought Bob Evans <coughs> Farms, and I mean, this is the kind, of, the kind of name that I'm, you know, that I'm finding now, which means it's another way of saying that the big, uh, the, the big names are, are, are no longer as, uh, as attractive. But Bob Evans Farms is a, you know, it's a family restaurant, uh, and they also have a, uh, a food business on the side that is uh, attractive. And they own all of their own real estate, which puts them, makes, makes them, uh, puts them in a different situation than the other uh, restaurants. It was reasonably valued. There's, there is a possibility, I, I can't predict it, but that they might do some financial engineering to take advantage of the value of their real estate. 
Um, and they do have a growing business, as I mentioned, that's outside the, the, the restaurant business that could be attractive. And it's reasonable kinds of multiples. And so in this kind of environment, I feel better about buying a stock like that than I, about, than I would about buying a stock that has tripled over the last three years or so. We're also looking at companies like McDermott. I bought some McDermott today. So McDermott is, is, is this is a good example. I can't really think of anything good to say about McDermott. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> but I can't think of anything good to say about it, and I, can't, and I haven't found anybody else to say anything good about it either, I, except that they're in a business where there are very few competitors, and the oil companies that use their services don't want to have just one. Mm -hmm. And so I know that the oil companies are going to keep giving them business until McDermott sort of figures it out. And one of these days, they'll report a quarter that's better than expected. And because uh, expectations are so low, that there's, there's real opportunity to make some money. And meanwhile, and meanwhile, the stock is trading at such a low valuation, I don't see a lot of downside risk. So I don't necessarily want to push McDermott because it is a little bit gamey, but it is an example of the kinds of stocks that I'm looking for now, where they're, it's, uh, they're underexploited. There's not much good to say about them, but it's reflected in the price, and there's real upside if there's a surprise on the upside. Fusion IO. It's, that's, a, that's a good example of the same thing. I mean, that's, that's, I, would, I would have brought that up if you hadn't. So that's a company which sort of hasn't been able to get out of its own way. Everybody likes their technology. Everybody thinks that they're the future of storage. Um, and, and they've got some very big clients, including Facebook and Apple. So you know, you, don't, you, you, know you, you can't really think that they have bad technology if Facebook and Apple are using them for storage. But, but Fusion IO has been a basket case of sorts. They've disappointed all the analysts. They've disappointed all their followers. And they're, but they're in a position where if they turn it around, there's a lot of upside. And so that is a more attractive thing to me again today than a stock that's already tripled. What are other ones that... Uh well, it, uh, the, the, in the, in the uh, oil and gas area, so I've been a bear, as you know, because we talked about this last time. I've been a bear, maybe too strong a word, but I have, I have been uh, of the opinion that we, we are re-entering an era of affordable energy and that we went through a long period of very expensive energy, which had very negative geopolitical consequences and very negative consequences to our balance of payments, very negative consequences to the value of our dollar but that we are now through the miracle of fracking and horizontal drilling and the shale oils and all the rest, we're at a point where uh, we're, it's plentiful again, I think. And, and that will have a long-term impact on the price of oil, long-term impact on the price of gas. What that means is that some of the established oil and gas companies, with the exception of Exxon, which has always been, a, been able to sort of handle this. But, but the wind behind the back of most energy companies is not going to be there in my view because I think the pressure on the price is really coming the other way. So if you're going to own energy companies now or oil and gas companies now, I think you've got to own ones that can add real value by the drill bit. And so I'm looking at smaller oil and gas companies that bring something to the plate from an exploration point of view that some of the big, one, big ones can't really do because they've got such a large asset basis to begin with. So two in that uh, area are Bill Barrett uh, and, and Energy 21. And they're, they're different companies, but they're both small. And they're both, at the end of the day, it's, it's a function of what they, can, th what they can add to their underlying reserves because they've got a different way of doing things. Bill Barrett is sort of uh, looking in one area. Energy 21 is really look, taking a look at older fields and reworking them with horizontal drilling. But in both cases, they're, they have the ability to significantly raise their production, and uh, which is what I think you're going to have to do to make money in that business. So that's what I'm doing on the energy side. But they're all, these, these companies all for the most part are smaller than the companies that are currently in our portfolios because I think that's where the opportunity is. Uh, talking about some of the more well-known names, you like Microsoft uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, you right. uh, call it a red-headed stepchild. <laughs> uh, they now have a new CEO. Yeah. And, uh, you, and that's moved up, actually. Right, it's moved up quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I was going to call you because it did a lot better than Apple. And we had, remember, we, had right. just, uh, we were here when Apple was doing uh, so. Uh, so it's not as cheap as it was when we uh, talked about it. it. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, we've trimmed a little, but not a ton. Um, 
I, I for one like the Nokia purchase. I think it makes sense. I think they've got to go in this in this direction. But I also think that that Microsoft could do a far better job of of managing its capital. Um, I mean, I do think that over the years they spent an awful lot of money on wild goose chases that haven't worked for them. I don't think, as I said, I think the Nokia purchase is, is a decent one. But um, I, and it is still one of our larger positions. But I don't see the kind of upside that I once saw. When, when it was 25 and we were talking last time, I thought it could be a $50 stock. I th still think it can be a $50 stock, but it's 37 38 now. So it's not quite, I'm not a buyer, but I am a holder. And uh, how is uh, Google contrarian? You know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, and I've been trimming. But we bought Google. It was, a, it was contrarian when we bought it. And I must say that it's hard to be a, you have to be a contrarian and a value guy on the on the buying side, but if you if you continue to be contrarian and, and value on the sell side, you sell these things before they make money for you, right? So you've got to the, the, the art form, in my view, is more on the sell discipline than on, on the buying. That's the discipline. key word, art. Yeah, and it is art. I mean, people will tell you that it's uh, science is just they're just they're blowing smoke. So, uh, uh, but when we bought Google back in you know three or four years ago, and it, it was around $400 a share, I guess, something like that. We reasoned that we were paying, we were buying the future of advertising. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't, for nothing, basically. We didn't, we didn't look about, we weren't interested in Android or any of their software or any of the other stuff that they're doing, which is now, you know, powering. Them. Our feeling was simply that Advertising was going to come back out of the recession, and that a far greater portion of advertising was going to go online in the new era than in the old era. It was just simple as that. That, that was as contrarian as, as, as we got. So it's, that turned out to be true, but it also, what we didn't bank on were, all, were the technological improvements and aspects of the company that has really powered it. So what we've done over time is we've sold it. We've, we, as, as it, gets, you know, it hits new highs, we trim it. We're not out of it, but we, you know, if, if we had never sold a share, <laughs> our performance would have been better. <laughs> and, uh, but, I mean, that's what we Story do. We, know, we lives, sell it on yeah. the way up, exactly. So. Xerox? Well, Xerox was pretty uh, contrarian when uh, we bought it, and, um, and it's really a cash flow story. Uh, the, uh, we bought it around 8 or 9. It's, you know, 11 or 12. Now it had gotten a little higher. We still own it. Um, it you know, it's the, it's the original business. Uh, but they also made a large acquisition in the in, in the services area. The services area, they, they've done a very good job there, and they've been, done a reasonably good job of, of, of integrating the two. Um, but what really strikes me here is that I'm, I'm not looking for Google-like growth here. I'm just looking for uh, a, a cheap, free cash flow story, and that's what it is from our point of view. And, and if, it, if it stays that way, then I think you might see some creative use of capital in terms of share repurchases or special dividends or whatever, but, but it's a cash flow story and I love cash flow stories. Uh, you mentioned Apple and uh, you've made the point that uh, Sony went from being the company to a company. Right, right. Uh, what's your assessment of Apple now? Well, you know, we, we did <coughs> buy it. I told you I was going to be the last one to buy it. We did buy it when it got uh, below uh, 500. I don't think we picked it right off the bottom, but we got pretty close. and. Um, when we bought it, pick a number, $440 or something like that. The first time it got to $440 on the way to $700, it had far less cash than it did, you know, per share than it did when it got to $440 the, the last time. So it's, it was more of a value story uh, than it, certainly than it was uh, on, it, on its way to $700. Um, but I'm a little wishy-washy on Apple. I think that, the, the, I still think that they, uh, the jury's out as to whether or not they're going to be able to continue to be the premier company in an industry where everybody is shooting at them. So it's, I, it's a value story and I'm, I'm sort of comfortable owning it, but I think that in order to add to the position, I'd have to see it at a lower price. Um, Intel. Talking about a stock. Yeah. Well, that's controversial. Uh, it's controversial because uh, even even within our own shop, I think our, our, our the analyst that follows it most closely is negative on it. Um, if you own Intel, 
you have to convince yourself of two things. One is you have to convince yourself that they will be a player in the mobile world. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you know, Intel tells a pretty good story there and they're working hard at it. And, uh, but even they would admit that, even, that if they are the player in the mobile world that they have been in the desktop world, it won't be at the same margins. So you have to be comfortable with, with that. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that, that where Intel um, has, I think, uh, uh, sort of a, a, an unexploited advantage is that the storage world is changing. Mm -hmm. And it's changing from, for lack of a better way of putting it, more specialized machines to more commodity-oriented machines that have Intel chips and a lot of soft, uh, software around them. And part of the Fusion I.O. story is really related in some sense to the way the, the, the storage world is changing. So if the storage world continues to change in that direction, then the, the, the server business it, that people worried might be going away for Intel might, be, might stick around for a very, very long time. So uh, there's plenty of market share there. There's plenty of revenues. There's plenty of cash flow. There's plenty of cash. You know, you'd love to own that company 100% now it is a private <laughs> so, um, but there, there's enough uh, <coughs> negativity out there so that it's a bit of a, it's a, a, a bit of a gamble to hold it at 24, 25, but I do, and I'm sticking with it. Any hope for P&G? Well, I think yes. There's always, my, my wife used to work for Unilever, and so she, <laughs> <laughs> so if you work for Unilever, you know that P&G is the 800 pound girl in the room. So. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, that those names, uh, again, those were great names, uh, consumer product names like P&G, like P uh, uh, Clorox, uh, um, Coke, Pepsi. Those were great names to buy in 2009. I don't, I, I don't think that's where you, the, the best place to look for the, now I think, you know, we own a little bit of it. I mean, I, I'm comfortable owning it, but it's not a name that's gonna be, uh, that I'm gonna be adding to uh, until we get around to another cycle, I think. Devry? Well, that's been a good stock for us. And it's, uh, um, uh, you know, it's doubled. Uh, so what's the story there? At the end of the day, uh, the, the, the for-profit colleges, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, are uh, subject to government financing and, and uh, you know, a lot of controversy with us, uh, but, but they, it turns out that they're much more economically cyclical than people realize. And so they, and they tend to do better when economies start to pick up. Because when economies st start to pick up, more students are willing to kind of take on the debt and do the work because they see opportunity on the other side. And so what we think, now there's been some internal changes at, at, at DeVry which have made it uh, a better run company. But I think the primary mo movement here is that we bought it when the economic outlook was pretty dreadful, and, 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 and now the economic outlook is better, not great, but better, and it's been reflected in their enrollments, and the, it, the news about sort of fraud in the private uh, uh, education space is sort of off the front pages, uh, and, and the whole Obama administration, which was sort of going after these people at one point in time, and trying to move all of the education dollars into the public arena, that's no longer, it seems to be on anybody's agenda. And as a result, the, 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 the stock has moved up. And, and uh, I, I just talked to our analyst about it yesterday, because I'm wondering, you know, should it be, is it time to take some profits? And his, he thinks it's a $60 stock, so. Hmm. Qualcomm? Well, there, I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's the mobile chip uh, business and everything that's going mobile and, and uh, I, and we, I, I think we bought the stock at a good price, but I don't think we bring anything special to that particular story. I just think that we were good bottom fishers and, and bought it, and, and, and it, it doesn't seem so uh, overpriced that we need to sell it at this point. You mentioned what's happened in the energy world with fracking and horizontal drilling. Do you see a renaissance in the heartland now? Well, Yes, over a longer period uh, term period of time, uh, but I'm not, and I do think that that the energy has a big role in it. But I also think that the more um, positive developments in the very recent past have been more political than they have been uh, 
uh, the energy side. I mean, I'm from Wisconsin, and it's sort of a miracle what went on in Wisconsin uh, uh, with Scott Walker and, and what's happened to uh, uh, the business climate in places that have historically been not so friendly towards business. Same thing going on in Michigan. Uh, those developments, I think, have, have got to play out in order for people to take advantage of the cheaper energy. Um, cheaper energy alone won't do it. You have, to have, you have to have a business environment that people want to be. But I think that, that between the, those political developments, the energy, and also some um, uh, 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 more equal wage rates from the Far East and, and, and in the Midwest that are all beneficial to, to, the, uh, to the heartland's economic outlook. And I, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm very interested in Detroit. I'm probably late in the game, but I, I think that you know, there, there's going to be opportunities in, in these places that have been fallen out of favor for such a long time. Um, and and it's, it, it's worth looking at. What's been your biggest mistake since 2008? Well, my biggest mistake in 2008 was, was uh, you know, not watching, not watching uh, the government closely enough to see what kind of, I mean, that was the real lesson for me in September of 2008, which was I never thought I'd see the United States government nationalized something like Fannie and Freddie. And I d certainly didn't expect to see them do so, you know, three, to three, three or four weeks after the Treasury Secretary said that they should raise more capital. Do uh, you remember that? We were ready sure. to sell preferred stock to the public and yeah. that it was a good investment. And then a, three, and then a month later, the, so I, 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 I think that the impact of bad policy um, uh, can be more detrimental to markets than I ever really realized before in my career. So I watched that closely to see if, if I can see anything uh, coming. Um, one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of uh, divided government is that less gets done, and uh, less is more. Uh, now, the notion that the uh, president t has talked about using more executive powers to sort of do, that's a, that's a worrisome thing, and, and I'm going I'm to watch that closely because I, I think that, you know, strong arm and bad policy can have a, a big effect on markets, and we saw that in 2008. Other than that, I think that, you know, you could argue that I sold some of the winners that we've, that uh, too early, and some, some of the names where I should have had the, the courage of my conviction, like maybe I should have held on to Google a lot longer. There's a, a company that's done very, very well for us in the pharmaceutical area called Isis Pharmaceuticals, which has gone from nine to 60, and I've got about a third of the position that I had when I bought it at nine. So I, I think that you know, the big mistakes you make in a bull market like the one we've had is that you, is you regret selling too early. Um, it, it's a high class problem. So that's been the, what's been your biggest success? Has it been well, there? I think that's been our, yeah, our single biggest success has been in, in that area on a percentage basis. But yeah. that whole biotech area has been a pretty good area uh, for us uh, uh, and for, for the markets in general because the, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is changing. And, and uh, the old models um, have sort of played themselves out. Uh, the, uh, we still own some Pfizer and we own some Merck, but, but they're changing the way they do business and, and, and their R&D budgets are coming down and instead of spending that money wastefully in, in, in many instances themselves, they're partnering more with smaller companies and we've been able to find a couple of smaller companies that have done pretty exciting stuff and, and, uh, and that was one of them. Well, thank you, Robert. My pleasure. Great to see you again. Good to see you.